Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Joining us from all over the world, Bridget Strawbridge Howard's great, vast army of followers and supporters and wonderful lovers of bees. Welcome to Norfolk Wildlife Trust's events in our Cly Calling series of events. Now, first of all, before I begin on my long list, of boring housekeeping. A huge welcome and many thanks for being with us. Bridget Strawbridge Howard, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. And of course, we're here this evening to talk about your beautiful book, Dancing with Bees. Now, if anybody hasn't yet read Dancing with Bees, shame, shame, and thrice shame on you, because this book will open your mind and indeed change your feelings about the natural world and about the wonderful creatures that live around us in our gardens, our parks and everywhere that's accessible to everybody in society. Bees all about us. But before we come back to Bridget, I have some housekeeping to do. First of all, we'd like to say a big thank you to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, who helped to support these events. And going into the future, North Norfolk District Council will be supporting us as well. So we're extremely grateful to both of them for their support of our Cly Calling events. Since this year, we can't hold them at Cly. Now, I've made a promise to Bridget that we will invite her to Cly one day, and we will show her our, our wonderful Cly Marshes Reserve. Now, these events are free for everyone to attend. However, they do of course cost money to run and we've got David Fieldhouse, our wonderful producer who works at Cly, behind the scenes. Now if you're feeling very sorry for David and want to keep him in a job, if you would like to donate, you will see a link in the email that you've received about this evening's event and it's also in the chat about this event which you can find at the bottom of your screen. So should you wish to make a donation of five pounds that would be enormously grateful and we thank you very much but we also thank you simply for being here. If you'd like to purchase Bridget's book, and please do purchase Bridget's wonderful book, Dancing with Bees, then you can do so through another link that's in your email and also in the chat attached to this Zoom event this evening. And should you follow that link, you will be taken to Wild Sounds of Books. There are wonderful partners who supply all of the books for our visitor centres at Norfolk Wildlife Trust. And the owners of Wild Sounds of Books, our wonderful friend Duncan and others, they very generously make a 10% donation of sales from these events to Norfolk Wildlife Trust, which again, in a very tricky year for us, they help us to keep ticking over. So if this evening you want to buy 50 copies of Dancing with Bees for all of your friends for Christmas, everybody you've ever met, you will be helping Bridget, you will be helping Bees, and you will be helping Norfolk Wildlife Trust. So thank you very much. We expect 50 copy purchase from every single one of you. Should you have questions for Bridget this evening, there will be a couple of ways of asking questions. You can pop your questions in the Q&A box, which you'll also see at the bottom of your screen. Now, some of them, depending on how time's going, I might read some of the questions directly to Bridget myself, or we might enable you to ask directly. And what will happen is that if I flag a question, you'll get a notification of that, and David will bring you in live to ask a question to Bridget. That's assuming the tech always works it doesn't always every time but bear with us we'll give it the very best shot that we have so once again thank you all very very much indeed for being us wherever you being with us wherever you are in the world and thank you Bridget Strawbridge Howard for being with us thank you for writing your beautiful beautiful book and for the work that you do on behalf of bees let's begin with honeybees because you make a very important point at the start of your book, which is that in the popular mind, honeybees are bees and everyone associates bees with honeybees. But in fact, there, there is a whole world of bees. So I'll start by reading something, your own words at you for a moment. But contrary to popular belief, honeybees do not need saving and becoming a beekeeper does not help save bees. There are no fewer than 20 thousand different species of bee in the world and the European honeybee is just one of them. So we should start by saying that you are a great lover of honeybees. I am. And there's a great deal in your book about them and of course your husband Rob loves honeybees but honeybees in the context of other bees. Yeah it's a 
big but and it's it's one of the reasons I wrote my book actually the, the main driving force behind my book was to um, to try and get out there the fact that it's not all about the honeybee um, and you know I started writing my book about 10 years ago um, and things have moved on you know there is a lot now in the media about um, bee decline pollinator decline but still I mean there was a something was published just last week yet again that made me think oh no it really is in in the the public eye um people still think that they can help with bee conservation by becoming beekeepers um and and becoming a beekeeper is a wonderful thing to do you know it's a great fantastic hobby um but it's not going to save bees and and i think so, so firstly, there's this misunderstanding that that, that you can help um, conserve bees or pollinators um, or wildlife by becoming a beekeeper. But if you take it one further, it's actually quite dangerous if, if too many people take up beekeeping in a small area, then, then you start to have this problem with, with the honeybees, you know, these vast, vast populations of honeybees out competing or competing with um, local, the, the native um, bees that would be foraging on the same flowers um, as honeybees. So, so that that's kind of where I come from. But important to add that you know we we have um, a, a log hive in our garden. We have honeybees, and I love them. Um, so so yeah. But it's it's a hard one. Whenever whenever ever um, I talk about bees, somebody invariably says. Oh, I know a beekeeper and I think oh gosh it just it's a hard one it's a hard one that it it's hard, hard to get that message out and your book does beautifully get the message out but in the defense of your love of, of honeybees you mention a book that sounds fascinating I'm very sorry I haven't read it but Moise Metalink, 1901. Yeah, I can see your face. Yeah, the, the passion, you swoon over the life of the bee. Just briefly introduce me to this glorious sounding book. Well, so, so yes, he, he Maurice Maitlink was a, a beekeeper, a playwright and a poet. And he wrote this book and it's one of the very first books I ever read about honeybees. And it, it was written in 1901, so you know it's old. And I think, I, I can't remember for sure, but I think he might still have been talking about the king rather than the queen, I can't remember. But he writes so beautifully, his language is so beautiful, the way he talks about um, the spirit of the hive um, is the first time I ever stopped and I, you know, I put the book down and I just saw bees in a whole different light. And I've read about them since in um, more modern books, um, you know, a, 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 about bee society and how everything they do is for the greater good of the whole. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're perhaps the ultimate socialists. I don't know. But the way he wrote about them just um, was so full of love um, and I, I think I was probably without being conscious of it a little influenced um, by the way he wrote about them when I started speaking about them and writing about them myself. It does sound like a lovely book and I have to confess I'm sitting here quietly punching the air because when one's interviewing one tries to identify the themes, the things that are important to an author. And much, much later on in the notes I've got for Question You, there's something about the osmosis between science and art and literature and, and almost spirituality, um, which is something that I identify in your own work. And, and you've just described exactly that. Um, for Morris Metalink, and so I'm, I'm delighted that you're, we're on the same page, or at least I've read your book vaguely correctly. Now, in our daily lives, we see honeybees, everyone knows about honeybees. The other bees that everybody knows about are, of course, bumblebees. And I suppose that the introductory chapter to our fabulous fauna of native bees is about bumblebees, because they're the most accessible, they're the most adorable. Um, and you say, nothing thrills me more than catching sight of my first spring bumblebee, recently emerged from her long winter sleep and preparing to establish a new colony 
of her own. And really that's the beginning of the book. It's the beginning of spring. It's the beginning of the, your exciting journey with bees. So tell us a little bit about what people can do in their gardens for bumblebees and, and what bumblebees live around you in your own allotment and your garden. Okay, well, first of all, there's a lot you can do um, and <clears throat> not just growing flowers. I mean, the growing flowers um, for bees, suitable flowers, that is, um, is, is um, obvious and that's what we're told all the time by the media, um, plant, plant, plant. So th there are lists and what I'm not gonna do now is give a list. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you that I have a few favorites, but um, it depends on where you live and, and what sort of plot or what size garden you have. But, but basically um, use every little bit you have. And what we do with our allotment is also grow vegetables and fruits, but we fill all the spots in between um, with flowers, with, with plants that flower. We leave, um, you know, things go to, um, to seed, we leave them to flower. Uh, but it's not just about the, the flowering plants you need you need to create habitat as well that that to attract bumblebees to come and nest in your garden um, and that means being an untidy gardener and just in the same way as you would leave log piles for sort of bugs and beasties and and small mammals it, it's always good to leave scruffy areas especially around the edge of your garden because bumblebees seem to like edges and in our own little garden, so we've got um, a back garden and a little front drive, and we had this year one, two, three, th three bumblebee nests, um, all in the edges. And one of them was in a wall, um, an old stone wall. So, so that's a you know they really do love the stone walls. Another was along a fence, and another was at the very very edge of the vegetable patch underneath some roots. Um, and what? Oh, and a fourth, yeah, it's a fourth. And two of them were buff-tailed bumblebees. This is the, the bumblebee that you most often find nesting in your garden, Bombus terrestris. Um, and then the, the other one that I love the most was the common carder bumblebee. And common carder bumblebees like tussocky grass or mossy areas. So, so common carder, they're called carders because uh, they, they, they use moss um, to, to sort of form the structure. Of their nests so so we kind of we don't we don't actually create areas for bumblebees to nest we leave areas wild so so the the sort of partially wild areas are the areas that they invariably come to and compost bins um, it's really worth keeping your eye underneath uh, on compost bins or compost not bins but compost areas that's another area you often get the bumblebees so um, I mean it, the, the what to do for bees in your garden it is is huge it's you know it's to do with planting throughout the year um or plants that flower throughout the year so that you're not just um you're not just covering spring and summer um but january to december these days because we do have winter flying um bumblebee species now um and just making sure that you you're planting um huge clumps of the same flower uh, is better than uh, dotting flowers here, there, and everywhere, uh, and and flowers. We always try to plant flowers that that have a long flowering season, um, and we underplant, interplant. So it's just trial and error, really. And um, and yeah, choose, choosing plants that are high in nectar and high in pollen and accessible to bees and other pollinators. If I were a bee, I would definitely be moving to the. Strawbridge Howard household <laughs> it sounds bliss now you've given me an effortless segue into my next question um, in summer sometime after the end of strict lockdown my aunt phoned me all of a panic about bees and they were in the bottom of her compost and, oh. and I said oh don't worry they'll be completely harmless and I she was concerned so I went over to see and in fact it was male tree bumblebees around, around in the bottom of her compost, which surprised me greatly. And I said, oh, OK, those are the one. But bumblebees are lovely. Bumblebees will never do anyone any harm. But this is the one group of bumblebees that you don't want to poke your nose amongst. So tell us a little bit about bumblebee mating and the behaviour of males of all of our traditional bumblebees and a slight bit on tree bumblebees and how they how they're the odd ones out. 
they are the odd ones out. So, so mostly, um, sort of towards the, you know, you start with the queen and she creates um, a nest and she lays her first batch of eggs. The, they're all female workers. They, they hatch out. They then she stays in the nest and they do all the foraging while she continues to lay eggs. And the, the, the sort of the nest expands and grows. And then at the height of its life cycle, um, it produces males um, and daughter queens. And it produces the males first and the males head off. They leave the nest, leave the colony, um, not just never to return. They're never allowed back in. The, the, the worker bees don't let them back in. Very, very different to honeybee society where they're spoon fed, literally. Um, so they're out on the tiles, these male bumblebees. And um, this is why you often find early in the morning if there's a, a bumblebee um, sleeping inside a flower, it's likely to be a male bumblebee because um, they've got nowhere else to go. So they patrol and they, they sort of, um, they hang out and they, they, they sort of drink nectar, waiting for the queens um, of their species to emerge. And uh, with, with most of our UK bumblebee species, so just put aside the tree bumblebee for a moment, um, they, the, the, the queens will only mate the once. Um, and almost as soon as they've mated, um, with, with one of the males of their species, they start to normally look for somewhere to hibernate, get ready to hibernate. And that could be as early as, as August with some species. Um, climate change has changed things a little and some of them have now started to start new nests um, and that keeps going through winter. But um, so that's, that's how it happens normally. Um, and different species will, will the males congregate in depending on the species um, at, at treetop level or hedge level or um, hilltop level, ground level, and, and they sort of will patrol and scent mark waiting for the queens um, to find them. So that's the queens find them usually. Um, now with tree bumblebees, and this, this is this is why during during the summer, you know, you get this this is interesting that that you're your neighbour or your friend. My auntie. Your auntie, that's it. She called you to um, obviously something that was buzzing because what tree bumblebees do, so, so again, height of the life cycle, the males leave the nest um, and the new queens um, emerge and they give off a pheromone inside the nest, inside the tree bee nest, which is usually actually quite high up. It's usually in an old bird box or the eaves of a house or something like that. And that attracts all the local males. And they come from sort of, uh, I don't know how many miles around, not miles and miles, but they congregate and they dance outside the nest, or in this case, the ants um, sort of outside the entrance of the compost heap. And they're waiting in what this particular species adopts is a totally different, it, it uh, sort of, um, uh, mating strategy, it pounces, they pounce on the, um, the new queens as they emerge and they mate. And this is the only species in this country where um, a queen will mate more than once. So, so she'll mate a few times with a few different um, male bumblebees. And it, it's during that time that, that, that the bees are dancing, the male bumblebees, that they look like a swarm. Um, and because of the way that, that so the, the, the tree bumblebees, if you've got a hole like that and it's kind of like in a, um, a bird box or something or compost heap, and the, the females are always inside like this. You see photographs um, on very, very high alert and every time a new bee, one of their workers returns, they sort of touch the bee with their antennae as she comes back and they let her in, but they won't let the males in. Um, and the thing is that they are on, God, they're on high alert. And that is why during that period of the life cycle um, of a tree bumblebee colony, those workers are likely to attack you, basically. If, if you come too close or if you use a lawnmower or a strimmer, um, or if you're like me and you're filming, <laughs> um, sort of being, yeah, far too disrespectful. And one of the incoming workers bangs into your head by mistake and you go like that, um, then they will chase you um, and sting you. So yeah, but otherwise they are so placid. They're very placid little beings. 
They are adorable. But now, you come alive when you talk about bumblebees, as you do all the bees. But I wonder whether Rob knows what a floozy you are with regard to male bumblebees. You say, <laughs> you say, were I a female bumblebee, I believe I might already have fallen a little in love. But as he turns to face me, the female bumblebee in me goes weak at the knees as I catch sight of his yellow chaplain-esque moustache. Yes, this delightfully dappled bumble boy. Thank you for that word, bumble boy. It's absolutely lovely. Sports a moustache. Now, how do you plead, Bridget Strawbridge Howard? Oh, how do you so guilty. Plead? Absolutely guilty. <laughs> I just adore them. I mean, like, yeah. Just, and it's one of the things, whenever I'm doing um, a, a talk, um, I do a lot of talks to gardening clubs, beekeeping clubs, um, uh, so women's institutes. And I always know, especially women audience, especially the, 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 the women in the audience, I have this beautiful photograph of um, a white-tailed bumblebee. I took it, um, oh, years ago on my patio when I was living in Malvern. Um, and I got really, really close to the, the male bumblebee and he just has the most gorgeous little moustache and they're, they're just beautiful. They, they are beautiful. So yeah, I, I do have a bit of a thing for the male bumblebee. You certainly do and it comes across. It, however much you might try and hide it, it comes across <laughs> very strongly in the book. Sadly, I, mean, I adore bumblebees and spend my entire summer, my office in summer is outdoors and I sit and I watch the bees come and go. But there are so many other species that we need to talk about. We have to leave bumblebees because you then go on to solitary bees, which of course opens up a whole can of worms. And just to read to you uh, your introduction to solitary bees, solitary bees come in all shapes and sizes from the minuscule Perdita minima of North America, which measures only two millimeters in length to the world's largest bee, Megakale Pluto of Indonesia, whose females can be up to 38 millimeters in length and have a wingspan of 64 millimeters. But of course, here in the UK, we are also blessed with literally hundreds of species of solitary bees, and they're all around us. Now, in your very own garden, you have leafcutter bees, do you not? Oh, we do. Yeah, leafcutters are, are, are so many bees are my favourites. Leafcutters <laughs> are And we have actually, for the last couple of years, um, on our, our doorstep on the wall, just outside our front door, um, we put up a number of bee nesting boxes. So bamboo, tubes of bamboo, um, which the bees in the front garden seem to prefer. So we put up all sorts of different um, bee hotels, they're often called, or bee nesting boxes. And um, the leaf cutters come, they're, they're, they're late on in, in the season. They're not the earliest bees um, on the block. Um, and just when you kind of thought, oh, the red masons are finished and I miss them, um, you, you sort of waiting and you see your first leaf cutter flying in and they're unmistakable. So that they're either carrying pollen in, in which case their their behinds kind of stick up a little bit, and they're they're covered in bright orange or yellow pollen. So you know that's the leaf cutter, cutter coming in, or if you're lucky, you see them carrying in a little rolled up piece of leaf, um, and it's just you just do a double take every time you see one because they it, it's so extraordinary to see um, a bee carrying anything, um, let alone carrying the materials to line its nest. So yeah, whenever this starts, I then I then spend the next few days searching the garden for the leaves that it's cutting um, so that if I can find them, I can stalk them um, and watch the, the, the bee actually doing the leaf cutting. Um, so yeah, that, they are great. And do you know, these are fantastic um, bees to encourage into your garden if you have children as well, because you're able to watch the whole life cycle playing out um, in your bee hotel or in your bee nest. And they're very, very safe. Um, whereas, I mean, we didn't mention, but bumble bumblebees, um, no male bee has a sting. Female bumblebees can sting, um, rarely do, but they can. There are very, very few female solitary bees that actually have a sting uh, that is powerful enough to penetrate human skin. And, and you know, leaf cutters, just so safe, so safe. 
And they're beautiful. I'm very lucky. I keep pointing at my little garden, which is that way. In the summer, I have um, patchwork leaf cutter bees, oh. and and I have willow bees, and willow bees nest in a bee box that I've got. Are beautiful. They're the sort of big, um, big heavy, oh. yes, great big solid leaf cutter bees. Um, but I also have lots and lots of one that I know will light your eyes up. I have wool carder bees all over my garden. In my purple um, toad flax, which is a, a plant you mention in your own garden for having um, wool carder bees. Tell us, Bridget, about the wool. I love wool carder bees. I think they're gorgeous little bees. They are extraordinary. So, so that out of all of our UK species, they're, they're one of the, the, the males are bigger than the females. So that's the first thing about them. That's different to all of the rest of our um, UK bees. They're very striking, they're very um, striking and easy to identify because uh, they're, they're sort of mostly black with bright yellow spots and stripes down their sides, down the abdomens. Um, but it's the behaviour um, that, that always, will, well it's, it's what you notice if you've got the right sort of plants and obviously purple toe flags, lots of the mints, lamb's ear, so it's, it's the bees, we have an enormous patch of lambs here in our garden and the um the males when they when when they emerge um go straight to the patch of flowers that they know the females will come to for foraging and something else that i'll come to in a minute so the males zip around like this um sort of up down you know in and out um of the stalks waiting for the females but whilst they're waiting for the females uh, they they also um, they will attack any other bee. You will have seen that in your garden, you must have done, um, including huge bumblebees, two, three, four times their size. They'll, they will attack, um, you know, a queen bumblebee um, and knock it to the ground because they are holding on to that patch for their females. And then the females of the species, gosh, the females, um, so they come to these plants for nectar and pollen, but they're called wool carder bees because whereas the leaf cutters line their nest with leaves, mason bees line their nest with mud and there are resin bees use resin, the wool carder bees, not to be confused with common carder bumblebees because people often do confuse them, they card the soft hairs on the lamb's ears and, and a few other sort of similar plants and then and I, I, I haven't seen this because, it, yeah, it's, they don't often use bee hotels. Um, they, again, they tend to nest high up, but um, I, I've read about it. And what they do is they take the hairs back. So they've got this little ball of hair. They take it back to their nest and then they tease each individual hair out of the ball and weave them into kind of like a little wallet, a little tiny little case. And you think these are tiny bees, these are smaller um, than honeybees, these, these, these female wool carders. And they make this minuscule little nest out of the carded um, wool. And then the, into that, they lay, uh, well, they provision it with pollen first and then, then lay an egg and then sort of seal it. And uh, it, it's in actual fact, I've never seen it and they don't use uh, bee hotels normally but they have done in Kate Bradbury's garden they've used one of her bee nesting boxes she has been able um, so Kate, Kate Bradbury for anyone who doesn't know is she writes wonderful books about wildlife gardening um, and bees um, and she has been able to watch this process happening inside a, a special type of bee hotel that you take um, the, the side off and you can see through the perspex so yeah, they are very, very special bees. Um, and the one other thing they do that's extraordinary, very, very clever, is they, they then, they also collect plant oils and they take the plant oils back and they use the oils um, to, to infuse the little wallet, the little lamb's ear hair wallet with um, some kind of oil that then it's believed probably deters parasites and um and sort of uh predators so yeah a very beautiful very clever 
very feisty males and very, very clever little females. There is something enormously appealing about a bee that weaves a little woolen cocoon out of lamb's ear fluff and then infuses it with essential oils. Now, if anyone's mind is being blown by this conversation, please, please, please do purchase and read Bridget's book. You will have it as a Bible for all of these stories, all told with the same loving enthusiasm. But I'm about to accuse you of being a floozy again, and I'm afraid we don't have much time for this because having talked with such effusive love about Willoughby's, um, Willoughby's leafcutter bees and about wool carder bees you say I adore the red-tailed mason bee she fills me with awe and wonder and embodies all that I love about the natural world she is without doubt my favorite bee in the world I know and do you know what when I said that I wrote that and my editor um, got back to me and she said, are you sure <laughs> you to put this in writing? <laughs> because once it's in writing, it, it, it will be quoted back at you. <laughs> and do you know what? I, absolutely, yes. If I was woken up in the middle of the night, I mean, my favourites change all the time, my day-to-day favourites. Someone woke me up in the middle of the night and said, favourite bee ever. I'd say, ask me a bike lap. <laughs> then you are acquitted I, of that I, I, although I, although you're flirting fast and loose with bees all over britain yeah. and many species you nonetheless remain faithful to osmo bicolor and, and next spring we look forward to her emergence so that you can coo again now we need to introduce a more sinister it albeit fascinating tone to the conversation because you also talk about a lot of um what scientists might call inquilines a lot of cuckoos and cheats and mimics and all sorts of other species first of all let's um cover cuckoos this is one of the most i mean it, your book is full of gorgeous descriptions but this um, knowing Bombus Repestris, when I first knew her, she was Cythirus Repestris. They used to be in their own countries yeah. when, yeah. when I was a lad. So I started watching Bumblebees 30 years ago and um, she was in a different genus at yeah. that point. So I still think of her as Cythirus, but she's now Bombus like all the rest of the Bumblebees. So the red-tailed cuckoo, or well, is that her English name? I'm not sure. Um, as their name suggests, they closely resemble their host queens, the red-tailed bumblebees. And you might expect that differentiating between the two would be a challenge, but it is not. There is something about this bee, something about its demeanor, not to mention its buzz, which sounds like a cross between a Chinook helicopter and an angry queen hornet that says, I am Bombus repestris. Be afraid, be very afraid. If I were a red-tailed bumblebee queen, I would be afraid. Absolutely, I would. <laughs> why would you be afraid, Bridget? Tell us about why you would be afraid of Bombus repestris if you were a red-tailed bumblebee. Right, gosh, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's awful because I don't like to use the word, um, I can't think of it, evil <laughs> when I talk about these. Um, and of course there is no evil in them. But, but these particular, there are six cuckoo bumblebees and Bombus rupestris, the red-tailed cuckoo bumblebee is one of them. And um, they, they basically don't, um, they, they don't make their own nests. Um, they don't have any pollen collecting apparatus. They, they wait, they stay in hibernation a little bit longer than the true bumblebees. So in this case, if you imagine the red-tailed bumblebee, one of our most striking bumblebees, a beautiful black velvet bee with a red velvet tail. And um, so she's been busy getting on with her own nest and um, collecting pollen and laying eggs. And then when she's reached the stage of her life cycle where she may have, um, oh, I don't know, a dozen, 20 or so um, worker bumblebees, that's when Bombus rupestris comes out of hibernation. Um, and so the cuckoo bumblebees, Bombus rupestris, um, sh she's able to, they use their antennae for, uh, to, to smell. So they, they locate the nest of a true red-tailed bumblebee. Um, and they'll hang around outside for a little bit, just so that the, the workers coming and going get used to them. And then they will sneak down into the nest beneath the ground and often underneath walls. This bee is often underneath the wall. The, 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 the Bombus lapidarius is the name of the red tail bee. Um, so sneak underneath and then lurk in 
some dark corner of the nest until the time is right to strike. And then she strikes and she attacks the incumbent queen, the true hardworking bumblebee queen. And the thing about Bombus rupestris, the red-tailed cuckoo, is that she's equipped to fight in a way that um, the, the true bumblebees are not so... So the bumblebees have these, these are ectoskeletons, aren't they? And they're made of chitin um, and they're black. So if you took all the hair off a bumblebee, um, all those lovely colored stripes, you know, they, they're kind of like black underneath. But the, so the cuckoo bumblebees have got very, very um, more solid, harder uh, the chitin, um, that they are more impenetrable to stings. And then the other thing is because underneath their abdomens, they don't produce wax. Um, like the hardworking queens um, to make little um, wax sort of cells to, to lay their eggs in. So they have no vulnerability um, underneath their abdomens. Um, and so then there will be a battle. There's a battle beneath the ground and the workers might pile in. Um, but, but in the case, of, I mean, you just need to see her to know she's going to win. Um, if this is out of all the bees, she is the heftiest, um, the most scary looking. Her wings are black. Um, they're usually a lot bolder, um, sort of the, uh, on the tops of their bodies, their abdomen. So, yeah, I mean, you would not want to be a red-tailed bumblebee queen underneath the ground if one of these be. You, you would not. I don't know when your children were young whether they made you watch the Star Wars films, but I have to confess that when, with the black shiny carapace and the air of, I have a Darth Vader image in my head. Are you getting the same image from? I I hadn't put that two and two together before, but yes, you're absolutely right, Darth Vader. Darth Vader bees. Wow. Is, is really what red tail cuckoo. So is. beautiful, extraordinary. It's so beautiful, also. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And they really are, and and these sort of the dark wings that are almost reminiscent of a violet carpenter bee. Yeah, they really are. Yeah. Dark, dark queen. They're fabulous, fabulous creatures. But there are other inquilines, other creatures that look like bees but aren't bees. Now we don't sadly, we've got lots of lovely questions coming in from your many fans. Um, so we don't have time to talk about all of them, but tell us, because I sense great affection for this marvellous little creature. Tell us about Volucella bombilans. Oh gosh, yeah. Well, all of that, that's one of the um a, a sort of like a um What's the, I don't know the common name. Well, they're hoverflies, but it's they're... Like the hoverflies that lays their eggs as well inside a bumblebee's nest. And they, and again, they look so like bumblebees. So this is not a bumblebee. And uh, they're furry. Um, and they, they, again, you might get for the red-tailed bumblebee, for the common card of bumblebee, for the white-tailed bumblebee, you get these little furry hoverflies, or big, actually, furry hoverflies that look all intents and purposes like bumblebees and what they do is they they also they don't kill the queen though and i watched on the out of hebrides i watched one of these lurking outside um i think it, i can't remember what nest it was i think it was bombus um but i watched one of these bumblebee mimics lurking outside and then coming and going in and out of the nest and what they do is they lay their eggs inside um the bumblebee's nest um, and, and their eggs hatch out and will eat the provisions that have been left for the bumblebees. What I didn't say, just quickly coming back to the, the cuckoo queen, the, the red tailed bumblebee, I should have finished that off, is what the, the, the cuckoo queen, uh, the cuckoo bumblebee, because they're not queens, what they do is once they have killed or defeated um, the incumbent queen, is they then lay their own eggs in the nest and the workers of the resident queen rear their young so that's that's how they complete their um that that's how they have their young reared but um so yeah so not quite as they they're not quite as scary i don't think the bumblebee um hoverfly mimics but yeah, um they're yeah. lovely creatures they really they're are and i see tell apart pardon difficult to tell apart from well, the you do. In, a, in a charming charming passage of your book you talk about you i love this idea that you score mimics <laughs> according to their convincingness and you give volucella bombilans a pretty impressive 10. I know. Um, and that was actually after discussing it with stephen fault because stephen very 
I was very lucky. A lot of people helped um, by, by looking at certain chapters to make sure that I got my facts right. Because, you know, I'm not a scientist. I, I'm just a, a bee advocate, someone who loves bees. Um, and and I, I think I had marked her down. I'd given her an eight and and Stephen disagreed and he thought I had to give her a nine. I, I can't remember exactly how it went, but he was right. Um, yeah, absolutely brilliant mimic. Well, far be it from me to um, be controversial, but I'm going to disagree with you. I think you are a scientist. Stephen Falk obviously is an academic scientist yeah. and is, is our great authority on, well, all manner of flying things, but in particular hoverflies and uh, bees. I mean, his, his uh, website, or his, um, it's Flickr, isn't it? Flickr, Flickr. Catalog. If, if anyone watching has not looked at Stephen Falk's um, Flickr page. He has this extraordinary catalogue of photographs of our British hoverflies, bees, all sorts of other creatures as well, which is just the most amazing resource. But going back to being a scientist, I think you are what we call a citizen scientist. Now at Norfolk Wildlife Trust, we've been running many citizen science projects now for more than a decade, 15 years in fact. And we have a wonderful person, Gemma Walker, who leads these campaigns and is just the most brilliant brilliant person for engaging people but you contribute so much now in this very context tell us about yellow loose strife bees and your own research and discoveries and contribution because genuinely i wrote as i was reading that i wrote down citizen science because that's exactly what you were doing so yellow loose strife bees are um, another one of our solitary um, species and um, so my husband was gardening a few years ago in, in a little village near here in Dorset called Sedge Hill and um, I used to help him a little bit with the gardening but mostly I was looking at the bees in this amazing garden and I found I, I found a bee one day, I followed it around, I photographed it like I do, and um, I haven't got great eyesight, so, you know, I often don't know what the bee is when I'm following it. And I bought the photographs home and uploaded them on my computer, um, and I really struggled to, to see what was going on with this bee, because it's, its posture was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, and I didn't even think it was a bee to start with, I thought it was some kind of weird crab spider or something. Um, so, so basically, um, it had its its arms, its arms. It had its legs stuck up in the air um, whilst it was buried. So its back legs sticking up like that whilst it was burying its its sort of head in the flower in the yellow loose strife, um, and covered in pollen. And, and I didn't know what it was doing. I didn't understand what I was seeing. Um, so, so I. I came home and I looked and I, I spent hours and hours on the computer sort of looking through um, the, the bee wars, the bee wasps announced recording society site and all sorts of papers thinking uh, suddenly when the penny dropped that this was a yellow loose stripe bee because it was on yellow loose stripe, but not thinking it could be, thinking it, it couldn't be because it wasn't in an area that was to me a yellow loose stripe bee type of habitat. And, and this is for the first time I ever really made the connection about not just thinking, oh, there's a bee in my garden, it looks like this, it must be this, but there's a bee in my garden, but why is it here? Don't understand why it's here. And yellow loose strife bees, you would find in the fens or in areas with lots of bogginess, um, watery habitats. And it, it, it just took me on this whole new journey where, where I married up for the first time, um, you know, history, natural history, geography, looking into the uh, parish um, council records to see if I could find any previous records. Um, and, and basically there had not been any sightings of this bee in this area. Uh, and, and I checked and double checked. I even contacted an amazing guy in, in um, the States, um, a, a scientist who'd written a paper about this weird behaviour of yellow loose strife bees where they stick their back legs up in the air when they're collecting flower, oils and, and, and pollen and nectar. Um, so so I, I, I basically learnt through that about the importance of what you call citizen um, science and and how important it is to record 
uh, th these bees that you you've seen that may always have been in the area. To, of course, they had always or been there for a while. But anyway, I I, I learned about the recording um, side of, of of bees at that stage, and so yeah, I, I kind of felt I felt a bit like a citizen scientist. Yeah. I you are a citizen scientist. I will. I will brook no argument. And of course, your encounter with the yellow blue bee is beautifully described in Dancing with Bees. I'm going. I have a big patch of dotted loose strife in my um, Lysimachia punctata, which I believe is what you saw. Yes. Yes, in my garden, and I live between a common covered in old ponds and a river. And so next summer, I'm going to camp by my dotted loose. No. Yes. And then I shall text you. I shall say, Bridget, Bridget, I've seen the yellow loose stuff. You've inspired me to look for the yellow loose stuff. Um, well, I hope you do, because it's very exciting. It's a very exciting bee. And that behaviour, by the way, of the, the, the sort of the back leg sticking up in the air, that is to say, I have already mated. I'm not interested. So, so if you see a bee with its legs in the air, um, and its head in a plant, then chances are it's a yellow loose stripe bee. Say so not interested. Not interested. And I shall know that the following year I'll be expecting the patter of tiny yellow loose drive yeah. bee feet, all six <laughs> of them. Um, I have to say at this point, just as an aside, our last guest, who was utterly, utterly wonderful, was the brilliant Erica McAllister, oh. who works with flies on, uh, at, on flies at the Natural History Museum and has written a glorious book that you can also purchase via Wild Sounds and Books. And again, if you do purchase through this event, Duncan will make a 10% donation to Norfolk Wildlife Trust. But I didn't expect anyone could enthuse more than um, Erica did about her group of insects, but you, with your acting out the behaviour of all of the bees, I think it's it's at least neck and neck, and you may at this point be ahead with still with still twenty minutes to play. I think you're doing very very good job of selling bees to people, Bridget. But that's a big part of what you do, really, because you have this wonderful presence on social media. You have lots and lots of Strawbridge Howard devotees and and bee followers and lovers and, and really the way you communicate coming really back to what you said about Maurice Metterling um, your work your presence is a fusion between art and you almost every day you tweet beautiful oh, yeah. beautiful beautiful paintings uh, sometimes your daughters but many times um, there's one of a fox that you've tweeted a couple of oh, times that just, <laughs> just slays me it's it's exquisite um, I think you see the world in a way that is beyond just the science of you're fascinated and engaged by the science of these and the knowledge of what these extraordinary creatures are doing. But I think you feel a creative and artistic and spiritual engagement also with these creatures and how they, they enrich your life, but also have, in a sense, created a new chapter in your life. Yeah, you're right. I, I thought about this recently um, because lots of people um, that I know are um, sort of purely mind um, people. And some some are mostly heart, or um, and I I flip between the two. I mean, I know I look very flitty as well, but um, I I do. I'm a thinker. Um, I like to solve problems. I always have done, um, but I, I'm also um, I have a creative side and, and a, a passion in me as well. And uh, that's probably why I never finished school. I didn't know what to do um, at school. I didn't know whether to go for sciences or arts or, or whatever. So, um, so I took the wrong A levels. Totally different story, and ended up with no further education. Um, and but this is. Yeah, what well, the bees for me have given me, um, I don't know, something where I can apply both sides. I hadn't thought that far, but they do. That's possibly one of the reasons I love um, bees and, and pollinators, wildlife so much, because I am able to think about it, watch it, love it. Um, uh, I can't draw it. I'm not. I'm not an artist, but I can photograph these creatures. I can. Um, I can look for for other pictures, um, paintings, um, prints of these creatures, and and so they they encompass all of those qualities. And 
and the spiritual side as well. Um, you know, I, I, I do, I do find that I go to a completely different place and I can lose hours and come as close as you can to peace, true, true peace and some kind of, um, I don't know, emerging with my surroundings or with the, the, the creatures, um, the, the bees or whatever it is that's around me, the, the wildflowers. So, so yeah, I, I feel incredibly blessed to have found uh, something. I mean, I was well into my um, sort of 50s, early 50s, when I started this journey, if you called it a journey. But, but yeah, I, I, every day I'm grateful to, to the bees for, it. initially it was just because I was worried about um, honeybees in America and colony collapse disorder that I even, that bees even popped onto my radar. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm still just at the very tip of the iceberg. Uh, the more I learn, the more I realise I don't know, and the more I want to know. So I think yeah, anyone who looks at nature is in that same category of not everyone is in the same category of being able to communicate and infuse in the way that you do. But everyone's in the same category of realising that the more they look, the more they ask questions, and the more they don't know. But you describe exactly what you've just said beautifully in the book. But since rediscovering the awe and wonder I felt for the natural world when I was a child, I've been blessed with the ability to see miracles in everything around me, in the big things, the little things, and the ever so slightly scary things. Every single day, no matter what horribleness is happening in my world or the wider world, I feel blessed in the knowledge that I can find solace, refuge, strength, and joy in an instant just by stepping outside. Now, I was going to ask a question about COVID here, and I've realized I don't want to, because we've talked all year, I've talked about COVID and the meaning of nature and how important it is. And I think in a sense, that's a given. I'm going to ask you a question. Were, what words do you have for someone, someone who might be watching who is, if I can coin a phrase, be curious, someone who has not, opened their heart to the joy of nature and the sense of connection. Someone who might be like Bridget Strubbage Howard at the age of 50, about to begin this journey. What do you say to that person? I say, um, get out into your garden and be with the bees, with nature. Um, it, it, again, it comes back to depending on whether you are a thinking person, a person who, who works from your head or your heart or, or whatever. Um, read, if, if reading is, is your thing. But no, no, actually be, just be, just get out and spend time watching the insects in your garden. Make the time and and then you, you just cannot help once you, if this, once you connect with just one type of bee, you start to notice um, you know, how they're behaving, um, how they're interacting with the flowering plants. Um, it, it's, I don't think it's, it's not a simple question. I, I would also say another sort of, um, it's, it's an awful thing to say, but read my book. Um, and, and the reason I say read my book um, is that that's why I wrote it. <laughs> I wrote my book I ha have a friend I wrote about her in in the book called Rachel Corby um, who's she's a plant um, shaman she's a plant woman and someone gave her advice when she wrote her first book and the advice was write your book for the person you used to be and and I did that I, I wrote my book for who I who I was when I first started out on this journey um, just just to there's just little, uh, little tidbits here and there and little bits of information, some big in-depth information. Um, but I think I'm searching and, and not quite getting that. I think permission, permission um, to stop um, being um, wh whoever it is you have ended up being because of the merry-go-round of life and the chaos that is all around us. Stop and just get outside, get outside um, and sit and and really look really listen um it's just time it's making time to stop and be and that comes across exquisitely exquisitely in your book so if you haven't anyone who's watching if you haven't read Bridget's book please 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 do because it is 
it opens your heart to bees, which is the most important part of you to be opened up. Now, Bridget, I think since we're running short of time, it's time we moved on to um, some questions. I'm going to read one first from Andy Harris, who says, that's in two parts here, um, your garden is full of emerging orange-tailed mining bees each spring. Is this from one nest or individual cells? That is from many individual nests. Um, yeah, the, the mining bees, all of the mining bees, they're solitary bees. They are solitary ground nesting bees and think of them as single mums. Um, each bee makes a nest in the ground, lots of little tunnels, little branches, little individual sort of um, cells and will lay a number of different eggs in that one tunnel and then they will emerge the following spring or the following summer, sort of whatever time of year it is that that species of mining bee comes out. So yeah, lots of single ones. And they, the mining bees, by the way, safest of all, very few mining bees have any form of um, sting. They're, they're the Andrina species and they don't have a good sting. And they're so pretty. Oh, they're so gorgeous. <laughs> Mind you, I could mention any bee at all and you go, oh, they're right, so, oh, they're so gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> David, are we able, please, to bring in Gillian McCready? Uh, there we have Gillian waiting to talk to us. Your microphone is about to go live. Let me see when it does. You might need, Gillian, I'm not sure, to enable your own microphone because I've still, there we go. Hello, Lovely, Gillian. If, if we can hear you, do you have a question for Bridget? Do you have, do you have, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, Gillian, okay. yes. Well, actually, I've now got two questions. Um, the first one was that I understand that bumblebees will stay with their nest in successive seasons, and they don't choose a new one every year, but um, maybe, maybe they do. I'm, I'm not sure. Do you know? They don't. I... So, yeah, bumblebees don't come back to the same nest. Um, so once the once the, the males have left and the new daughter queens have left, um, the incumbent queen, the queen that started the nest, dies. All of the workers die, and the the nest becomes defunct. So it ceases to be a nest. You may have a bumblebee, a queen bumblebee, may rediscover that same next nest site the next season and may come back and use it. But it won't be. Um, it, it's not the norm. That's not the norm. So they, they don't use the same nests again. Now, another question, which I'll read to you this one from Fiona Sharp. With regard to planting large clumps of flowers, how important are garden highways to bees? Are they like hedgehogs and lead, need lots of appropriate connected plants in close proximity? Brilliant question. Um, hello, Fee. Um, so yeah, uh, this is terribly important. If, if you think of... Um, yeah, the, the wildlife corridors that we're all encouraging um, councils to leave you know, on verges for wildlife to move around. Exactly the same for bees with gardens. And one of the things that, that I always suggest when people say, what can I plant in my garden for bees? I suggest that you have a look and see what's missing in next door's garden. Um, sort of what time of year has next door uh, not got covered? And then you could put something in your garden um, that will flower during that time of year. But the bees, the, the, the less they have to fly, um, the less distance they have to fly to get from one foraging patch to another, the less energy they're going to need to use. Um, and that, you know, that's good. That's good bumblebee economics. It's just to conserve energy. So, so it would make a huge difference if everybody planted for bees in their back gardens and their front gardens. So yeah, absolutely. There are some really wonderful questions here this evening. Now, David, can we bring in Nicola Coe, please? There's Nicola. Nicola, I'm just waiting for your microphone to go live. And then I'm there. You I think we can hear you. <laughs> the dog's barking. <laughs> the dog is welcome too. What's your question for Bridget? Um, we had two bee hotels up in the summer and they got filled with leaf cutters. And then a woodpecker had a go at them. So I took them under a shelter we have in the garden that's open. But I'm in two minds as to whether to take the cocoons out 
and clean the bee hotel or to leave it be and then what time they might come out and if I take them out when should I then put them back in and all that sort of thing that's actually an incredibly good question for um, a particular reason if you had said mason bees red mason bees I would say yes clean the cocoons um, now is a good time to do it um, and put them somewhere safe in a cool dark place over winter but leaf cutter bees especially those that nest later on in the season are a little bit more fragile because um, whereas a mason bee will lay its egg its egg will you know they 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 sort of go through the larval munching stage and then they pupate and then they by late summer they are adult bees inside um, the bee hotel and they then hibernate in effect through to the next year leaf cutters bees that are sort of have, have um, been laid as eggs much much later on in the summer will often remain in a pre-pupal state over winter so they have that they, they may not have turned yet into adult bees so very very fragile so if i were you because it's leaf cutters i'd leave them until next year and then next year you could um more safely take them out um of the of the 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 nesting tubes depending on what sort of nesting tube your tube is i mean it, it and but i would leave them would not touch them i would not touch leaf cutters this side of christmas is the answer does that make sense right and um, we've lost and uh, i've forgotten the name there of the person and so nicola um so we'll move now on david can you bring in trevor alt please very interesting question here um this will be this will be one that certainly i don't know the answer to this one david can we bring in trevor alt i'm afraid so trevor has left us so he won't trevor's left okay well his question i'll read it to you uh bridget um does light pollution affect bees Wow. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would think they are more likely to be affected by pollution. Um, you know, if it sort of heavy pollution in the air because they would not be able to locate directions with their little eyes, the ocelli on the top of their head to find their way home. Um, but light pollution. So we have street light right outside. Um, our house and I don't see the bees, um, the leaf cutter bees being active late into the night with the um, the street lights on so so I don't know the answer but I would say from my own observations out here no. Um, interesting one yeah. Yes I also was scratching my head over that and not, and not sure but on the subject of things which affect them Ruth Hurst has a question she's uh, passionate about wildlife but she feels devastatingly sad much of the time at our destruction of habitat and biodiversity. How do you stay positive in the face of all the devastation that we as a species cause and the enormous ongoing decline in biodiversity? So the answer is I'm not always um, positive, but it doesn't last long. Any negativity I have just doesn't last long. Um, I, I feel that um, as long, it's, it's not just hope. Hope's a funny one because hope is kind of tied up with hoping that something will change, but not doing something about it yourself. Um, I just, um, I, I just think I see so much improving as well as going downhill you know and when I see things like tree bumblebees and ivy bees are expanding their range um, in the United Kingdom and doing so so well here um, I, I and I, I read so many um, different uh, takes on this as well from the scientists who I trust I read something on Twitter um, Lynn Dix posted something on Twitter um, this morning that, that made me feel very, very hopeful again. Some research that shows that, that, that things are maybe not as bad um, globally with, with, with the, the creatures that, you know, the, the insects and um, as we think they are. So it's a hard one. I, I just basically have, I don't think there's any room to give up. I think we just have to keep being hopeful, keep doing what we can to make a difference and keep believing 
that what we do makes a difference um, on whatever scale we do it. Ruth, if I can come in with a little bit of an answer to support what Bridget has wonderfully said. Um, we are great friends at Norfolk Wildlife Trust with Simon Barnes, who's written many beautiful books about nature. And in my favourite of his book, well, my equal favourite of his many books, um, How to Be a Bad Birdwatcher, he says, but there is a worse crime than crass, dis uh, than crass destruction, and it is despair. And the antidote to despair is hanging upside down on your peanuts. And we as naturalists, as, as Bridget has just said, we have a, no matter how difficult it is, we have a moral obligation to keep fighting the good fight because nobody else is going to do it. And so in a sense, it's almost a, it's channeling your anger, it's channeling your feelings in order to positive action. And, and if ever you needed inspiration to do that, it's, it's right here. And it's perfectly obvious, Bridget, how many people you are inspiring and how many people are asking questions and I'm not going to get through all of them all, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, Corinna Wilmoth has a question here. So her local vicar arranged a bee day and everybody involved was a honeybee person and all of it was around, yes, the same old, same old really. Um, so she offered to host a stall on wild bees. Aside from your fabulous book, plus a few others, I have Stephen Falk being one of them. What do you think would most interest ordinary folk and open their eyes to the wonderful world of bees? Book wise, Dave Goulson's books, um, anything by Dave Goulson, sort of um, Buzz in the Meadow, um, oh, The Garden Jungle. Um, yeah, really accessible, packed with information. Um, I would also, because you, you mentioned that this was a, a church, um, your vicar, have a look at, there's a wonderful charity called Caring for God's Acre. Caring for God's Acre, and they're based in um, just on the border of Shropshire, I think, in, um, and and they, they're just a good one to get in touch with. But yeah, Dave Goulson's books, um, all of them, any of them. Brilliant, thank you. Now, it's been very noticeable that the huge majority of questions that have come to us this evening have been from ladies. And there is clearly a strong connection between women and gardens and flowers and bees. But despite that wonderful connection that comes across so strongly in your own book and your lovely friend who has that deep spiritual relationship with flowers and encourages you to make a relationship with a dandelion and that is an exquisite passage in your book. It's just, just beautiful. Um, but there are two men who are very, very important to your book, just to finish off. One of them who really deserves a mention for two reasons. One, because of Heath Potter Wasps, and the other because he has provided so much beauty that supports the beauty of your words, John Walters. Yeah, John, John, is, John, John illustrated my book. And um, uh, as soon as the, the day I knew I wanted to write a book, I knew I wanted John Walters to illustrate it. Um, he, I have learned so much from John. Um, he, he's, he's a naturalist, he's a, he's a wildlife um, artist, he lives on Dartmoor, and he is, he is so self-effacing, he's so knowledgeable, he's so gentle, um, and his illustrations, but for me, they bring, they bring things to life, they are alive. Um, he paints in the field in watercolour, he paints what he sees, he makes little notes um, in his paintings. And uh, I, I have just, um, I, I, I feel privileged to know him. I feel I, I was over the moon when he said yes to illustrating um, my book. And, and his illustrations are exactly what I wanted. I wanted them to, to bring my words to life. And, and I feel that he did. And I also, there's, there's a chapter in the book, um, the, um, on Bovey Heathfield, all about Heath Potter wasps. And actually, it's pretty much my favourite chapter. It's the chapter I enjoyed reading the most. So yeah, so so yeah, I, I can't thank John enough um, for the part he paid in my book, making my book. Certainly, certainly, his illustrations are quite quite beautiful, and they 
beautifully illustrate the points that you are making. Now, I just have to, if, if your book is not embarrassing in the, slight, in the slightest, but to embarrass you here with your own description of your, your own self-effacing description of yourself of the encounter of the, with the Heath Potter was with them. <laughs> um, <laughs> although I have seen lots of John's photographs and paintings of these clay pots, ne uh, plot nests, seeing them in person makes me want to clap my hands and squeal out loud but I contain myself and restrict my appreciation to making more grown-up remarks such as, wow, oh my goodness, and I can't believe a wasp made these. <laughs> it's that, that girlish joy in seeing them that, that, is so, that brings the book to life. Now, one other gentleman is clearly hugely, hugely significant. He is he's the silent partner all through the book because in the allotment, you know exactly what I'm about to say, in the allotment, in the garden, in your love, of wildlife and your connection with wildlife. Your husband, Rob, is, is there at every turn, isn't he? He is, I know, and I, I could not have written the book without him. I, I wouldn't have a garden without him, you know, especially because I've been writing for the last few years and, and he has created, and I don't know if anyone who's, who's here this evening has seen any of the little wildlife videos, um, the garden videos I've made of the garden, but that is all Rob, he, he has just created um, a paradise for pollinators in our back garden and on our allotment um, and he does it just you know um, without thinking really I mean he is a gardener so of course it comes naturally to him but but yeah what's been really lovely is is we only met um, seven or so years ago um, and we, we, he's a bird guy, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's a birder um, and, and a beekeeper and we've kind of, I've learned so much from him about birds, so my love of birds has developed because I've been with him and, and um, he's learned more and I think um, become more um, fond of the, the wild bees as well um, through me, so yeah, I, again, I've been incredibly lucky, especially at my stage in life, to meet somebody and to sort of meet a um, a soulmate and a kindred spirit. So it's well, never too late. How very beautiful, how very, very lovely. And we are delighted for you. And that relationship shines in the book as your relationship with nature does. Now, before we finish off, because I've been making Bridget speak for an hour and 10 minutes now, and we're very grateful to everyone who stayed with us and who has listened and who has contributed. But just to round up one more time, we're extremely grateful to you for supporting our Clyde Calling events. Lots more events can be found on our website, which is clydecalling.com. You can find out about our next event, which is with Matt Gore, who lives in Suffolk, our neighbours to the south, and he's written a beautiful, beautiful book called Under the Stars, his second book of nature writing, and we'll be interviewing him on the 17th of December. Find out about that on the website and lots of new events have just gone on the website today. We've got um, Roy Dennis coming back to talk about his second new book very soon. We've also got an event with uh, Megan McCubbin and Chris Packham about their new book. So we're really thrilled. There are lots of other people as well. We have a very exciting uh, series of events coming up next year. So please do visit our website, Ply Calling. Dot com for all of the virtual Norfolk Wildlife Trust events coming up next year, or oh, indeed with Matt Gore is the remainder of this year. Please don't forget that should you wish to buy 50 copies of Bridget's exquisite book for all of the people you've ever met to give them as Christmas presents. There is no finer Christmas present than the gift of loving bees and loving wildlife and loving your own little patch. You can do that through the link, which is at the side of your screen in the chat, but also in the emails you've received about this event. And by so doing, not only will you support the glorious work that Bridget's doing, but also the work of Norfolk Wildlife Trust through a 10% donation, which Wild Sounds and Books will kindly make to us. And of course, should you wish to make a donation to the work the Norfolk Wildlife Trust does as a result of these events, we would be hugely, hugely honoured and grateful. Now, it remains for me to thank Bridget for a completely wonderful conversation. And I wish to do so by quoting you at yourself a couple more times. One thing which really shines in everything you do, it shines in your persona, it shines in your online persona, it shines in the work that you do representing nature. Loving nature means so much more than enjoying it and appreciating it. And more than photographing and writing about it, it means 
standing up for it, fighting for it and accepting it unconditionally, warts and all. And you are a paragon of so doing. And we're very, very, very grateful to you. And finally, I love this, the very last line in your book, and next time you see a bee, don't forget to thank it. And we would like to extend a huge thank you to you for talking to us this evening, for your book, for all the work that you do. Thanks for being with us, Bridget Strawbridge Howard. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been an absolute pleasure and we would like to extend thanks to everybody who's been with us this evening. And with that, thank you and goodbye. Thank you to everybody as well. Thank you for coming along.